This 10 minute edit is a summary version edited from the full interview. The full episode is available for YouTube and Patreon members. Viewing stats state that the average audience listening time is 10 minutes, so this edited version captures key elements of the discussion. Members receive the full versions in advance of the shorter edits. In this Climate Gen episode, I speak with former UK chief scientists and chair of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group, Sir David King. Sir David explains what is going on with the Antarctic sea ice and how this connects to the wider global climate system. We also discuss the differences between Arctic and Antarctic sea ice and how the North Pole is at risk of releasing vast quantities of methane that could send global temperatures soaring. All of this inevitably leads to the question of action to reduce risk and steer humanity back onto a survivable pathway. Sir David highlights the dangers of what we are all being offered by the incoming COP28 presidency. The next episode of Climate Gen is recorded with former President Obama advisor and National Security Director Dr. Alice Hill as we discuss the retreat of the insurance industry in the US as climate change proves too risky for business. Thanks for listening. David, it's good to see you again. Thank you very much for taking the time. I just wanted to start by asking you about the data coming out of Antarctica regarding the sea ice lows, because a lot of people are very worried. Can you talk about how you interpret what you're seeing? The first thing is that the data shows that the sea ice around Antarctica appears to be suddenly retreating. And I'm just talking about this year and the last few months of last year. Uh, the, the sea ice has retreated about 1.9 million square kilometers compared with the norm at this time of the year. So I'm talking about the end of May when the figure would normally be 9 million square kilometers and it's now down to 7.2 million square kilometers. That's uh, the biggest drop ever observed. And it means that during the summer months, when it's normally 3 million square kilometers, it is now down to less than one or just over one. So it's a, it's a very severe signal that in the summer months, there will be much less sea ice protecting the ice on land around Antarctica. Okay. And it's this buttressing effect where the sea ice almost acts as a blocker to stop those land ice sheets sliding into the sea. Can you just give a quick overview of how that's different to the to how we view sea ice in the Arctic? Of course, the North Pole is an ocean surrounded by land. The South Pole is land surrounded by ocean. That's the most important difference. So what we're seeing in the North Pole region is that the ice has retreated from the sea around the North Pole. And what this means is that the warm sea is then raising the temperature of the land mass around. And we're seeing all sorts of absolutely damaging effects in terms of the whole world. So in the North Pole region, we have rising sea levels. When all the ice on Greenland melts, sea levels will have risen by about seven meters. And I'm talking about the global average sea level rise. Obviously, the map of the world has changed dramatically by that. And equally, the land mass is heated up and we're already seeing explosive release of methane from the permafrost. Let's go back to the Antarctic. In the Antarctic, because the oceans are warming up and are warming up rather quickly now, we see that warm water can penetrate between the ice on land. Antarctica is this vast continent. It's penetrating between the land and the ice and creating a slippery layer, which means that the danger is that we get very large chunks of ice coming off the landmass and entering the ocean. So the ice around the South Pole region, around the Antarctica, protects the water around that region in terms of its temperature. So it keeps the temperature cooler. That's the buffer effect you've just referred to. When you look around the world at the moment and you see 
things like this new El Nino developing straight off the back of the La Nina. And you see in extreme situations, though, the Atlantic being above its normal temperatures and so on, and the Arctic heating away. Is it conceivable, do you think? I know you've got to wait and see, but is it conceivable that we that we could be sort of crossing some sort of threshold? It seems that like everything's going up a notch. We're always slightly notching up. Is it too early to make those kinds of... I'm afraid it's not too early. So, for example, if we... Let's go back up towards the North Pole region where things are happening much more quickly. We know that we have this wind blowing anti-clockwise around the North Pole region, which keeps cold air in the North Pole region and warm air away from it. And it, it, that means it keeps us warmer than we would otherwise be. We know that that roughly circular wind is now massively distorted. And it's distorted because if you create warm atmospheric air above this exposed Arctic sea during the polar summer, that warm air is driving the cold air further down. And as you drive the cold air further down in one place, warm air comes up in another. And this is really disturbing the global weather systems dramatically already. All of these extreme, extreme weather events we've been observing, you've just mentioned what's happening in New York today. But in 2021, the uh, weather extremes on the West Coast were simply amazing. So, uh, and when I say that, I mean five to 10 degrees centigrade above the previous warmest ever observed on record by human beings in that part of the world. So I think it is, I'm afraid, a sign of the times. If we're not actually tackling the root cause, which we don't seem to be, we're going into you know another year of extremely high emissions. How can we honestly look at interventions if we're not actually prepared to, to reduce our emissions and give up fossil fuels? That you are absolutely right. We are still moving in the wrong direction globally, even after that wonderful agreement in 2015 that we were all going to do everything we could to stay below 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level. It's now clear that with this El Nino event that you have just referred to, which is a Pacific Ocean event, with that event coming on so quickly after the La Nina, we know that the climate is going to be suddenly warmer around much of the world. And so all of these effects that we've been seeing over the last four or five years, these extreme, extreme weather events, uh, can only get worse. And I think it is awful to say that emissions in terms of billions of tons of greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere every year are still going up quickly. The carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere going up now at two parts per million per annum. And two parts per million per annum is higher than ever before. So we're, we're not managing this. If we don't bring down from, we're now well in excess of 40 billion tons of greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere every year, unless we can bring that down to 10% of that figure within 20 years, let's say, it's very difficult to see how we create a manageable future for humanity. You mentioned the Paris Agreement, and in a way, that was the year when everyone rejoiced that the world leaders were getting their act together and were going to do something about this, enact the policy that would make structural change. And yet, a year later, Trump was elected and things went sideways and so on and so forth. And now we see protesters quite prepared to be put in jail, really making a noise. There's like a sort of desperation in the uh, action. Are we at a point now where people are waking up to what's really happening, and yet the policymakers are entrenched in a sort of last century view, if you like? We're not ready to snap into this action to get rid of our emissions. And, and the word I think you used previously was agile, about this need to be agile in our processes. And we, we seem to lack that agility. Yeah. We lack the agility. We have become bogged down in a dramatically 
destructive mode of operation. I mean, I, I think the United Nations has still got to be the critical pathway forward. That's the only body that represents all nations. But if you have a negotiating process in which any country can send as many official negotiators as they like into those annual negotiations, and the average is now 20 per country, that means 4,000 negotiators meeting for two weeks. How do you negotiate in that sort of atmosphere? When I was leading from the Foreign Office, the British side of the negotiations, I had explained to the heads of governments that I was working for that we need to have bilateral action. And that's why I visited 96 countries on official visits in the run up to Paris. Those bilateral negotiations were for me, the only way of breaking this log jam. Now, the problem is that we are back into the log jam and all of the promises made in Paris, all of the promises, I mean, there are very few countries that are delivering, have not been adhered to. I was talking to Salim al Haq yesterday from Bangladesh, and Salim was saying, all of you should come to Bangladesh. You cannot speak to anyone over the age of 12 who won't tell you what the challenges of climate change are. Because in Bangladesh, it's not tomorrow's event. They are losing acreage by the year. And really, if you take all of what we've just said, and you pitch forward to COP28, which is controversially being hosted by the UAE's head of their national oil company. What are your thoughts on those ties and what appears to be a dampening down of ambition to phase out fossil fuels in those terms, as opposed to reducing emissions through carbon capture and storage? This, of course, is the big worry about COP28. Simply having it in the Middle East, the biggest oil producing area in the world, it was already a bit of a red flag. And then to have Sultan al Jabbar, the man you're referring to, run the organization. I've met him. He's charming. He's a lovely guy. You wouldn't mind having an evening in the pub with him. But he believes we will consume more and more oil and gas going forward in time, we globally, and we will capture all of the carbon dioxide and so we can manage to get to net zero by 2050. So there's a person who's in the presidency who is the nightmare scenario person, right? Is that scenario that I've just painted that they'll say, ah, good, get on with it, you guys. More money for the scientists and technologists, and we'll keep producing the oil to pay for it. Well, thank you very much. It's been great to speak to you. I think we've covered all the bases. And uh, can I say thank you, Nick? I always enjoy talking to you.